Leia Healthcare. It's good to live. Proud sponsor of the Real Health Podcast with Carl Henry. Folks, welcome to the latest episode of the Real Health Podcast in association with Leia Healthcare with me, Carl Henry. This is one of the most fascinating episodes, I think, that we're, we've ever produced on the Real Health Podcast so far. Um, it's an episode about mental health, but it's also a raw story of dark depths, uh, attempted suicide, and the ability to overcome and deal with the thoughts in your head. It, it, it's a topic that's so prevalent in Ireland, frighteningly so, and I think a lot of it, a lot of the prevalence we don't actually get to hear about, that when we got approached by our, our next guest to have on, I thought it was crucial that we do. Um, Graham McCormick has joined me in studio. He's a former MMA fighter who in recent years has been very open about his battles with anxiety, depression and mental health. A lot of which through social media, which is where I would have become aware of him. And his frankness, his ability to talk about it, I think is an incredibly powerful message for anyone around the country struggling with mental health, but particularly in the area of alpha male sports, which it's prevalent, but we don't, there are very few people discussing it. And to have someone who shines a beacon from that sport to say, you know what, hands up, I suffered with it. I, and we'll hear, we'll hear a story in a minute. Uh, I think it's incredibly inspiring, uh, honest, frank, and brave uh, thing to do. Graham, that's a very long introduction. <laughs> Welcome to the Real Help Podcast. That was definitely one of the longest ones I've heard. I'm telling yeah. you, it certainly is. Well, How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure to well, be here. Thank you for coming in. Um, let's start with, with I want to start with your MMA career. That that was your thing. You got engrossed in it. Um, I want to chat about how you got into it and what you were getting from it. Um, and when you started to train and all that kind of part of your part of your life. Let's start, let's start there. Yep. So I suppose my MMA career started, I think it was around July 2010. Um, I'd just recently been released from the psychiatric ward after my first attempted suicide. Wow. Yeah. So basically when I was released from the psychiatric ward, I was just, I was, while I was in there, I was pummeled with medication. And then when I was released, the medication strength actually went up. So it was horrible. And a massive side effect of the medication is excessive hunger. And wow. within the space of even four or five weeks, I had put on serious weight. I was on tablets in the morning, afternoon, evening, and nighttime. And uh, nighttime were my strongest doses. And I would wake up in the morning, just have no recollection of what's been put into my body the night before. And I would look at the floor and it's just crap everywhere. Just sugar laden fat, everything. It's all over the floor. And just no recollection of it. And that really upset me that I felt I had no control at that point. And when I believed that I had no control, of course, then I acted like I had no control and I was eating everything around me and I put on lots and lots of weight. I remember coming out of the shower one 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 day and just looking at myself in the mirror and going, Graham, hang on a minute now. Mentally, you, you're not well and now physically you're becoming unwell. You know, you need to make a change here. So normally I wouldn't have acted on something like that, but this time I did. So I rang a gym and it turned out to be a martial arts gym, but I was just looking for some fitness basically. So I went up. I started training in the fitness aspect for about two weeks and, you know, I started to feel amazing straight away. Endorphins and eating right and everything else. But I went up one night after about two weeks and the coach for the fitness wasn't there. And so I was kind of, you know, kind of stuck, left in limbo, like what do I do? And over the other side of the gym was a martial arts uh, section. So there was boxing and Thai boxing, wrestling, everything, everything else over there. So kind of just gently floated over there with a bit of fear and I hopped into the boxing class instead. And from there, I basically got beat up at the end. <laughs> Not there was no there was no ego involved. It's just that I had no technique. It was my first time doing boxing, but you know I felt felt comfortable there. Then towards the end, that I'd always had this massive fear that you know I was made of glass, and you know if there was a fight in school, that I I just run the opposite side of the school. You know I had a lot of yeah I had a lot of fear growing up and anxiety. Yeah, I put on this bravado persona to actually deflect bullies away because I tried everything else you know please leave me alone and of course that didn't work that actually made it worse so you know I was always in a state of anxiety underneath it all but on the outside it looked like this tough guy and I think that held well when I started training the MMA then at the start so it went from there really yeah. So was the MMA a, a family is the wrong word but a, 
a group or a space that you felt comfortable and safe in an environment where you felt uh, addicted maybe because exercise can become addictive over a, particularly within an addictive personality yes definitely within that space I felt very comfortable I felt very welcome and the fact that I used to feel like I was getting the head punched off me I actually wasn't because when you are after a spar and you sit down and you chat you can realise that there was no aggression involved in the person who was coming towards you it's training it's you know what I mean for me it was training you'd sit down on the mats you'd have you know a discussion something might be said and you know I normally had a habit of holding everything in and normally acting out speaking with my behaviour so I might drip something in there in conversation just be like you know it wasn't the best last night and you know people were like oh Jesus, kind of shocked and you know that's when it kind of started that oh I didn't feel judged here at that point they felt, oh, that's bad. But then they were like, oh, tell me more. So it did, in that space, I did feel comfortable and it did feel addictive then, yeah, with the training especially. How did you go then from, I want to come to this space to be healthier and to lose some weight and all of that, to competing? As in, I want to, profess, to try this as a profession. How, how, how did you go, make the leap from, from one to the other? It was the feelings that I was getting. It was okay. it had to do a lot with being outside my comfort zone. Again, something that I'd rarely done, never done anything like that really up to that point. Hopped into training, found out it wasn't really made of glass. My jaw wasn't. Um, I felt comfortable in that space. You know, fellas were, you know, I suppose they were letting me open up to them. And you know, it was a lot to do with the feelings of that space. After about three months of that continued uh, training, my coach came to me and said, look, you're a bit of a sponge here. You're, you're soaking everything up and you're putting it into practice when, when needed. So would you like to fight? And straight away, I went, of course I do. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> but underneath, I was like, oh, crap, here we go. You know, and that was actually, it wasn't a nice feeling, but it was, you know, it was thrilling. I never felt that before as well, you know. So it was, it was nice, in a way. And how hard is it as a sport is it to make it? Obviously, in the last couple of years, with lots of different uh, MMA fighters, uh, obviously, Conor McGregor maybe being the, the, the front man, but there's loads of others, obviously, too. How difficult is it to make it? To be good at it? It's pretty difficult. I would absolutely say to people that I coach and people who aspire to be an MMA fighter, only a select few will make it. And, you know, with McGregor and everything else and even Paddy Hoolan and all the other fighters that have made it from Ireland, they've opened the door for us. So it's not extremely hard either. You know, um, I suppose your desires have to meet action. And sometimes, you know, the... MMA fighters in their peak would be their early 20s. And that's, in society nowadays, that's normally the time to party. So, unfortunately, you have lads who are, you know, pretty skilled, um, but mentally are being drifted away from the sport, and it's unfortunate to see. Now, as I said, a select few will stick with that and will stick it out. And I always say to, you know, my fighters as well, that, look, you can party when, you, when you're done. When you, when you get to where you desire, then relax. But until then, put the, put the work in. It'll be, it'll be worth it, you know. But even at that, still a select few only make it. Let's talk about the fight. Uh, title fight? Yep. Yeah, that was 2012. Yeah, that was... Leading up to that point, I had eight MMA fights. I had five wins, three losses. I had two boxing fights. I had one win, one loss. I was ranked fourth in Ireland for my weight class in MMA. I got my blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. There was production companies from England coming over recording me at fights and, you know, things were going pretty well. The future was rosy. Yeah, yeah, so I believed. And at that point, I got offered the, the chance to fight for that belt, so I took it. And that was mid-2012. It was June 2012, down in Wexford, a show called Cage Gods. So went down, travelling from Cork to, to Wexford in the car, felt a bit kind of... I always had anxiety, a bit of nervousness, borderline anxiety, but this time I felt really, really sick in my stomach. And I just, I didn't know what it was. I couldn't, you know, couldn't put, put my finger on it. So went down, went into the dressing room, was really felt sick and nervous. And I was like, oh, this is kind of overpowering here. But anyway, I just didn't really know what it was. I just fought through it. And when I say I fought through it, I mean 12 seconds, because that's all the fight lasted. Yeah, I got knocked clean out in the first round after 12 seconds and... I remember hitting hitting the deck, looking up, and just seeing hands waving over me. And that was the referee saying, you know, that fight's done, forget it. 
and I just accepted it. I lay down and I got picked up by one of the medical team and one of my team members and I was walked through the crowd and I remember being walked through the crowd, I remember all the things that I was hearing, you know, and it was people jeering and laughing at me, you know, a very macho, you know, young lad audience. On the way into the ring, presumably, it's the opposite, which is you're being built up, you're being encouraged, promoted. The ego has been, you know, because you're going into fight for a title fight. So you're, you're, you're built up on the way in and on, on the way out, it's, it's, it's the opposite. Yeah, it's it's very easy for someone who's not in the sport to be like that, and okay. it's it's black or white. It's come on, let's you know, let's let's fight here. We want to see it, and then if if you lose, like I did, you're judged as not good enough. And that's not everyone in the audience, but there is some people in there who are not involved in the sport at all and have an outsider's perspective. So I was, it was like that. And once I was walked through the crowd and brought into the dressing room and kind of looked around for you know someone to say something generic like "better luck next time" or whatever it may be, but no one said anything. And within that silence, all that I, I basically got in tune with was how bad I felt. I just felt horrible. Absolute silence and I felt horrible. And in that moment, I said, that's it. I'm done with the sport. Forget it. Never will I fight again. So basically, at that point, what I was walking away from was everything that kept me sane. And that was somewhere to go, something to do, I had to eat right because I needed to look after my weight. If I was late for class, I had 100 burpees and I absolutely hated burpees. Everything that was there was no longer there now. And all I was left with was I was actually taking alcohol and drugs at that point since 11 continuously throughout my career. Yeah, because basically I didn't understand that I could process these negative emotions and negative thoughts. I thought they just, at that point, I thought they overpowered you and I didn't know what to do. So... I had used alcohol and drugs. And so in that space, after the fight, I felt like absolute crap, really. Um, I was taking alcohol and drugs and I had nothing to do. And that's a recipe for disaster in my experience. And from there then, after about six months of that, I actually overdosed and ended up in the psychiatric ward. Yeah, again. That was horrible. (laughs) And that was, I actually... That was the medication that I was given, was, you know, that's how I overdosed, unfortunately. The medication that was supposed to keep me well and and better, um, I actually used against me. Where do you go from there, is my question. I I, I have no sense of, 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 like, like, talk us through that. So, if 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 that's okay, yeah, of course, that's that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. So, like, what happened? Because adversity, I'm fat, and resilience are two things I'm fascinated by, and I think you have them in absolute spades. Um, you, you with unquestioned because to come back from something like that, mm. and to build yourself back up again from something like that, and that was the second time. Yeah. Uh, talk us talk talk us through the days, the weeks after. I could I could probably talk you through the years after that. Great. And from 2012, which was that title fight, till the 31st of October 2016, within that period of time, I had two more suicide attempts. I had eight more, seven more after that psychiatric ward stays. I was on 16 tablets a day for my mental health alone. I ended up homeless for three months. I wasn't allowed to see my daughter um, temporarily. Uh, for obvious reasons, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and had a bowel resection, and I had pretty much three quarters of my colon taken out. Um, yeah, it was horrible. I and also, I done a therapy called dialectical behavioral therapy in the middle of the, of all that, which is mindfulness based. That was huge for my recovery. Okay, so talk Absolutely us so huge. talk us through that then. Okay, so I was diagnosed in that in that time frame of those few years with borderline personality disorder. Mm-hmm. So it's a mood disorder. Mm-hmm. From there, my psychiatrist said, look, we have a therapy specific to your illness. Would you like to do it? And I said, I don't really care, to be honest. You know, it's either do or die. If I, you know, if I don't do this, I'll just end up dead anyway, so whatever. That was my attitude towards it. And she couldn't force me on it, so it took a bit of persuasion a couple of sessions meet for her to kind of go look just just give it a go so i did i agreed to that and it's a year long 
it's mindfulness based. And I remember the very first session I had with my psychotherapist and she sat me down one to one and she said, look, we're going to practice mindfulness. I want you to just close your eyes. And so I closed my eyes and within seconds I jumped back out. I was like, no, 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 not a hope. And she was like, what's what's going wrong? And I said, look, I, I don't want to be in my head at all. It's frightening. You're not in my head. You don't understand what's going on here. And she said, look, you signed the contract at the start of the therapy, which I did, the course, to say that no matter how I felt that I would still carry on. So she reminded me of that and I went, all right, fair enough. Look, we'll just we'll just try it. So luckily enough, I did try it again and I lasted for about five minutes this time. And I had to write out everything that I observed within my mind and it was, it was frightening to say the least. It was... I was very un- I was very unwell at this point. Um, there was screaming going on. There was intrusive thoughts. I thought I was hearing voices. I was extremely paranoid. I absolutely hated myself. I had images of my daughter dying. There was everything going on within that five minutes, and I had to write it out all on paper. And I did, and she just went through it all. And she was, you know, the at its core, mindfulness is becoming aware in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And within all of that as well, there's an element of acceptance of what's going on whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. So if you don't judge it and you use an element of acceptance, then that means it's just happening and there's no suffering for you within it. So I had to accept all my thoughts. I had to accept all of them. And it was not easy. And within that therapy as well, after about nine months of actually practicing mindfulness on pretty much a daily basis, I actually became aware of myself and my triggers and everything else and what was going on. Because... In that moment when I fully became aware of myself, I had basically had a thought, okay, Graham, you're a scumbag, over something that I had done or blamed myself for doing. And then after that thought, I had a feeling of of shame, of guilt. And then I observed an urge to self-harm, which I was doing a lot of. So I never before observed an urge to self-harm. Normally it would be, oh, I feel like crap, and then I would just self-harm. I did not know that it was broken down into stages like that. Talk to us about the self-harm, the level of it. Yes, so my self-harm began when I was seven. Yeah, I was in primary school just getting bullied and I did not know that it was bullying at the time. I just knew that words didn't really just hurt. They really, really hurt. And I came home one day and I was really, really angry from what went on that day. As a male, I felt I just couldn't see anything. My mum and dad just hold it in or whatever. And I ran up the stairs and I just, I looked at myself dead in the eye and... I, I blame myself for everything the bullies were saying. I felt so much anger that I lashed out of myself in my face and I just kept repeatedly punching myself until you know, until the anger subsided. But, you know, I was seven. There wasn't much damage caused, but for me to go there at seven was, was damage enough. And that seven, I mean, it, it carried on throughout the years from that point on. I mean, you know, I would grab something sharp and, and hurt myself. I would out cigarettes on my body I would bang my head against a wall I would actually choke myself um, out of intense emotions that's how, how, how far the self-harm stretched and my sister used to always say to me especially with the with the sharp objects on my body that you're going to go too far one of these days and that I did because in 2015 I was in a toxic relationship, it wasn't. It would, it, to be honest, it wasn't good for either of us. Um, we were awake for about three days straight, taking alcohol and drugs. There was no food, no sleep. At that point, I had really, really hated myself. Um, I lashed out out of anger, grabbed something sharp, and attacked my body. And I attacked my hand more specifically. And from there, I freaked out. Um, after seeing what was happening to my hand at that point, I ran out of the apartment at about six o'clock in the morning. This guy passing for work, I presume, took off his jumper, his T-shirt, wrapped it around my hand, called an ambulance and walked to work without any top on. When you say attack to your hand, yeah. uh, in terms of in, with the, with the, with the, with the knife or with the... Yeah, so the, the sharp object, the knife, and I had cut my wrist. And I hadn't actually just cut my wrist. I had severed my artery. And I was, the ambulance took about 30 minutes to come to me um, and another obviously 30 back. I was losing a lot of blood. And when I was uh, arrived at hospital, um, they put me on the bed and I had to have emergency artery reattachment surgery straight away or I would 
pass on, basically, from blood loss. From there, that went okay. That was fine. Um, a couple of hours later, this guy came along. He was a hand specialist, and he said, look, surgery went well, but we'll probably have to amputate your hand. Yeah. So he actually left me with that belief that I, I would have my hand amputated for three days. And for someone who hates himself, themselves, self-talk is horrible. Now, imagine being like that and also just believing that you're going to lose your hand. Within those three days, it was horrendous what was going on in my head. I, I never, I just thought I'd never pick my daughter up again. You know what I mean? I thought I'd never work. I thought I'd never do anything that you need two hands for. And he came back after the three days and said, look, you're lucky. We're going to save your hand. You're going for a plastic surgery in the morning. So I'd have three further plastic surgeries, um, reconstructive surgeries. I had about a year and a half of intense physio. Yeah, and yeah, that's, I still have my hand, thankfully. So the trauma of that pushes you to take the course. Yeah. And the mindfulness after the night, after practicing and after working through the rehab of it and, and looking inside yeah. and reflecting. So this was looking back to move forward, I suppose. Then that gave you tools with which to prevent the triggers for the, the harm and the self-harm. Yeah. 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 So what I was learning on the course were, they're basically termed skills. So they are things that you would implement when you feel high, intense emotions. And that day that I became aware that I had an urge to self-harm, I, as I said, I never had that before. I didn't know that deep within myself that an urge came up first. There and then when you feel the urge, so basically they break it down into stages. It goes thought, feeling, urge, choice, and then the action of self-harm usually. I did not know I had a choice after an urge. After the urge came up, when you understand you have a choice, that's where you implement the skills that I learned and that I did. So that could be dunking my head in freezing cold water in the sink. It could be having an ice pack on the back of my neck. It could be flicking an elastic band against my wrist until I couldn't stop them more. Um, rubbing ice cubes on my body where I used to self-harm. A lot, a lot, a lot of skills. There was plenty of choices. Um, but within that, for self-harm, I didn't know that there was things that you could do that pretty much gave you the same sensation as uh, the action of self-harm, and that was the ice cube. Because without going into too much detail, it, it burns on your skin. And that's pretty much what it's like when you hurt yourself. Yeah, so implementing them as much as I could. There were some days I didn't want to implement them and I wanted to self-harm. And there was other days I just wanted to take my medication and go to sleep. Um, it was horrendous, yeah. But gradually, you know, bit by bit, 1% better, that's it. You might go back a couple of steps, but you keep moving forward. And that's what I did. And that's... How do you take yourself from that to what is possibly the most, in my opinion, pressurized space to talk about this, which is social media, um, through your Instagram, which I've seen, I follow you, uh, and your blogging. And uh, where, how, how do you go from that to the decision, which is, right, I'm going to blog, I'm going to tell people, I'm going to tell the world about me <laughs> and my issues and my imperfections and my learning and does that not provide a huge amount of pressure for you in terms of just the impact of putting stuff online? So to touch on the pressure aspect, it does. I wouldn't say huge pressure because when the pressure arises within me and I feel that, I go, it's okay to put your feelings aside because there's a greater cause happening at this minute. So it's the same when I go on stage and I speak at events and everything else or even in businesses, whatever it is. It's, I feel that nervousness, but I'm like, you can actually put your feelings aside here because there's a greater cause, again, happening at this moment. So, yes, there is pressure, but there's a greater thing happening as well, you know, and that's the message. And was that something you discussed when you were coming to the end of the, of the, of the, the DBT course with your, presumably with the doctors or with the team there, which is, I, here's, I'm now going to uh, publish this? No, what, 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 I, what actually happened there was, on the 31st of October 2016, which was the end of that year gap of, of the madness, I like to call it sometimes, um, I was weighing 18 stone 10 pounds from, yeah. from all the medication I was on, and I used to walk around at about 11. So, again, it was one of those crossroads where I was like, Graham, you really need to make a change here, or you will end up dead. Like, 
So from there, I locked myself in my bedroom for about three months. Um, not literally, but... Um, Thankfully. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I locked myself in there, um, <laughs> metaphorically. And I said, look, I'm coming off drinking drugs. I'd always relapsed on that. I'd always said I'm giving up and, you know, everything else. But, you know, uh, it hit me hard. That? It hit me hard. I mean, you know... I felt at that point, and I'm not saying this about everyone else who uses or whatever it is, but I felt at that point that it was all about me, you know, how I felt, and oh, I'm, I'm in so much pain here, which I was, and there's no denying that. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a father. Again, that's thinking of something outside of yourself. And, you know, I, on reflection of leading up to that, I said, look, Graham, you're a father here, like, you know, suicide is generational, like, it goes down, like, you know, you need to make a change here. So I did. And that was the locking myself in the bedroom for three months where I done daily mindfulness, uh, meditation, uh, yoga. I'm, I'm more often not hurt myself with the yoga. Um, <laughs> and I said I wouldn't leave my bedroom unless I'd done at least 20 minutes of exercise or some some form of movement on a cross train or whatever it was. Um, and that was that was pretty much it. That was me for about three months. I just secluded myself. I was in isolation. So and you detox yourself off the drink and the drugs through... Meditation, mindfulness, movement, uh, and determination. Everything natural, yes. Yeah. Because, like, you know, substances and chemicals are not natural for the body. So I said, okay, how about if I stay away from that and come over to the actual natural movement that this body craves? And I work on my mind and I stay away from people who I would normally trigger me or I, I would associate with alcohol and drugs and just see how that goes. And it went pretty well, because after about nine months, I'd lost five and a half stone. Wow. <laughs> I tried every diet under the sun. I tried keto, I tried paleo, I tried low carb, I tried carb cycling, I tried everything. If it fits your macros was the one that kind of stuck for me, in fairness, mm -hmm. no, it was. And yeah, five and a half stone in nine months, and there was no stopping me. <laughs> and I just kept going and going and going. And... I think it was actually at the three month mark of my weight loss journey. I said nine months, which was the finish kind of, but at the three month mark, I, an old training partner of mine actually ended his life. Yeah, so I was hit with that after three months. And then on his year anniversary, which was December 2017, uh, the, that's when the blog went up. I said, okay, it's coming up to the year anniversary of my friend's you know, suicide. I'm feeling pretty emotional. I know it's a stressful time for people at Christmas financially and everything else. And, you know, I have a story. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> yeah. So I threw it up on Facebook first and I just turned my phone off. I was in absolute fear and panic. So I went in town. I had about 12 green teas because I was really <laughs> spiritual at that point. Um, I came back. <laughs> I came back and I turned on my phone and I remember my hand was shaking when I turned my phone on because the fear that I was having was around the comments and judgments. I have that fear on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we all do. Anyone on social media does. And it was a fear of, you know, the judgment that, oh my God, he took alcohol and drugs. What an addict. Not knowing that, you know, I didn't know how to process my thoughts or emotions and it was horrendous and I needed to numb it somehow. I wasn't getting the help I needed. Or he wasn't allowed to see his daughter. What a terrible father. No, no, I was very mentally unwell at that point, and it was the right thing to happen. But I looked at the comments. There was 350 of them. Not one was negative. I think I approached the 46,000 people mark uh, with reach, and I was getting message after message saying, thank you very much for your honesty. And, you know, what you're speaking of there, that's my daughter currently, or that's my son. And I, I'm, I'm glad there's light at the end of this tunnel because I don't believe it. Because there is a frightening prevalence in Ireland now of addiction, suicide, mental health issues. Mm. What do you think is growing that? What's pushing that? Because I, even on a personal level, I would hear it's nearly monthly at this stage of someone, not directly, but through some vague network who has attempted suicide or committed suicide. And they're generally young men. Mm. Not always, mm. but a lot of the time. Um, and it seems to be getting worse and worse. And what uh, what do you think's behind it? I think it's, there's a few things, I believe. I think social media is one. Um, now, I would say that social media can, used, can be used in, in a very productive manner. Not so much when you have this 
guy throwing up uh, you know, a picture of a six pack and a Gandhi quote underneath it, and you can kind of you know you can it's the <laughs> vice versa on the female side of things. Yeah. Um, that's not helping anyone in any way, shape, or form. That's actually adding to the issue. Um, other than that, drawing you know comparisons and I'm not good enough, um, and not knowing how to deal with their emotions, then turning to alcohol and drugs because in society that's the thing to do apparently. Uh, no, it's so not. It's a skill set. It's not having the tools or skills to be able to process the thoughts or to deal with the emotions. I believe so, yeah. And that's why I'm out pushing mindfulness as much as I can. In secondary schools and businesses and everywhere. Workshops and hotels, I'm doing it as much as I can. Yeah. Does that scare you? Which? The public the, doing the, the workshops and doing the, 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 the corporate work and doing the, the schools. And, and if it does, how do you handle it? Um, I'd be lying if I said it didn't. It does in a small way, but the greater part of me doesn't really care. I'm all in. Um, Because for years, I was basically obese from from my standards and what I was, uh, lying on my couch, thinking of ways to end my life. Uh, I wouldn't leave my house. I I wouldn't even sleep in my bedroom because I was paranoid that there was evil spirits there. That's when I was very, very unwell. It was horrendous, and I just, at that point when I started to lose the weight, which was obviously a couple of years after that, what I just spoke of, I was like, this is never happening again, and I'm going X, Y, and Z, and I'm going here, and going doing this, and I was dreaming very big, and I said to myself that if I create a life worth living, then addiction will have no part to play in it, I won't use, why would I want to destroy something that I've created, that really means something to me, and within that is positive impact, not just on myself, but on others. How do you create the balance now, if that's a fair question? So just in chatting to you, I, 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 A, I'm obviously I'm blown. This is the quietest I've ever been in any interview I've ever done. <laughs> but it, 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 there's, there's, lot, there's lots of, there's extremes, if that's, a fair, if that's a fair point. How do you, now, how do you provide the balance in life? Or how do you, how do you ensure that you don't max out in terms of, all of the work and, and, and the you know the, all the positivity and, and that and that that doesn't get tire you out basically. So or do you have a do yeah. you have a coping mechanism for that? I do, and it, it's called mindfulness again. It's becoming self aware and knowing when to put in a pause and go. Hang on a minute, you're focusing externally here on others. I think right now how you're feeling is time to f- to focus internally and, and you what's going on within you. So mindfulness is huge for that. Just becoming self aware, knowing when to put in the pause, and also with balance i think that's just this place that doesn't exist it's like perfection it, we strive for perfection and you'll never actually get there it's the same with balance you you think you have balance and something will t- tip the scales the opposite way it's just you can't get there but i think it is just knowing you self-awareness is huge and just knowing when to slow down a bit that's all and when you're focusing on others or yourself do you surround yourself with people who might say you know let's take a weekend off or let's you know uh, who might help you get that balance or not? Not really, no. no. Okay. No, no, no. Um, when you lock yourself in your bedroom for three months, you're pretty all right on your own. You can come <laughs> out of that. Um, and and I am. And there's some days that, you know, I would be in a bit of an ambivert. I would kind of, you know, prefer my own company and then kind of, you know, I need to you know, connect again with others and, and that's fine. But... Even at that, I, I'm pretty solid in, in being my own enforcer in a gentle manner and going, okay, you've self-awareness here, you need to slow mm-hmm. down, just do it, be a man of your word, and, and I am, and that's it. You know. We chatted about social media there, that, that's where I became aware of you, um, I followed your page. Uh, where can people find out more about you? On those, what, What's your social media handle, and where can people find out more about you? Yeah, so I'm on, uh, I suppose, Facebook first, under my own name, Graham McCormick, and it is... This, oh, I hate the term but followers page whatever you want to call it um, so I'm on there under my own name yeah. and I'm also on Instagram under the real world Buddhist and that's where I am I'm currently getting a website built Fantastic. so that's that's fine that won't be out for another I think around two or three weeks great so yeah but you people Facebook, Instagram and then your website when it's built so they can keep an eye out for that yeah. Graham honestly thank you so so much for coming in to studio here in uh, Independent House uh, for being so frank for talking about topics that we haven't touched on, but we were hoping to find the right way to do it because it is so prevalent. And I think of our listeners who listen in, many will 
know of somebody or potentially be aware of somebody who's having mental health issues. And I think tuning them into this episode will be an amazing place to start. I think any uh, people who are involved in, in even education for young people, for an adolescence, I think your, your skill set message is, is very powerful in terms of, and it, you, you identify it really well, which is once you have the tools and the skill set, you learned how to handle emotions. And I think in terms of our school cycle, I think that's an amazing place to go to slow down the rate of suicides and self-harm that we're seeing across the country because social media is only getting bigger so we have to match it with the skills to, to let people yeah. to be able to deal with it absolutely um, yeah. folks you are listening to a very somber but i think possibly one of the most powerful episodes of the real health podcast in association with leia healthcare i really hope you enjoyed the episode uh, i've been sitting here in awe of just listening to graham and his story and what he's been through and his mission which is to help people um, manage their emotions and manage their mental health. I've seen his social media stuff, it's fantastic. Do follow him. If you have any uh, feedback or any questions at all, you know where we are. It's realhealth at independent.ie. Um, I suppose the requ- from my own perspective, the request here would be to share this with anyone you know who has any form of mental health issue, any form of a, a potentially addiction issue because we're not there's no judgment on this show there never has been what we do is we learn from people and i think this could be one of the most powerful episodes that we've done from that learning process because we've learned from someone who's gone through the ultimate male macho dominated and female too but predominantly male macho dominated arena of sports and who has come out the far side of it holding their hand up and is willing to discuss really openly um, their own experiences and it's from experiences that we learn um, I think this is an episode that could do have been listened back to once or twice just to really gain the, the, the benefits from it uh, I certainly will be doing that myself over the course of the next couple of weeks have a wonderful week and as always we'll see you next week so long ago Graham thank you If you've been affected by any of the issues raised in this podcast, please contact Samaritan's Helpline on 116123 or the Aware Helpline on 1800 80 48 48 or Pieta House on 1800 247 247. Leia Healthcare. It's good to live. Proud sponsor of the Real Health Podcast with Carl Henry.